everyone. Thank you very much for all your feedback and comments on my last video. As always, I very much appreciate them. Now this week I ventured out somewhat from my usual stomping ground and went further up into town to meet up with some other mud-loving friends who you may well recognise. And this video is all about our outing and what we found. And one thing I will say is that things aren't always what they seem, but sometimes we don't find that out until a lot later but it doesn't make them any less meaningful. And having said that, and now that you're completely puzzled, thank you very much for accompanying us, and I'll be back later on to give a round-up of what we found. So thank you, and see you later. Well, I'm off to meet Chill Bill and Cy Fines on the foreshore. We're not there yet. As we're going to do our Christmas special. And so I have, of course, got my tinsel out, tinselly boots, and let's hope we find some tinselly finds. Christmas down ho, at the Thames. Ho ho! Hello, Father Christmas. Now these steps are very slippery, so I hope that um, Chill Bill isn't going to go head over heels. Very, very slippery, very, very dodgy. Well, it's, so it's, it's clean. It's clean. Yep. Good, good mud larking conditions. He's on his way. He's on his way. The stairs are too. Yeah. So we're about to start our Christmas lark. So, boys, what are you hoping to find? Chill Bill? Anything. Always anything. Anything. Cy, so yeah. got any particular desires? I, I don't have any particular desires. I know a few good things have come up here recently in terms of quite some old, old artefacts. So for me, the older, the more interesting and the better for me. But the Thames is like a big, a big bag, a big mixed bag, you never know what you're going to find. big Christmas stocking. Exactly, yeah. It's a big lucky dip, so big you, never lucky know, dip. you never know what we're going to find, so that, and that's the beauty of it, that's why I love it, you know, you never know what's going to turn up next, as you, as you know. Okay, it's well, gone forest companies. <laughs> well, I'm hoping for something golden sparkly, so uh, let's go. Okay, so Nick's just found a rather large find. What you found, Nick? I found a boat. Well, the remote. Something standing in this boat here, though, yeah. exposed. You see all the old, um, all the old nails there? Little rivets and the old nails. So it's Beautiful. gradually being eroded out. Okay, you can just see it in all its uh, former glory. Beautiful. And that's what the erosion does, it brings up things to life that we've never seen before. Well, so far there's lots of bones here, as you can see bones and bricks, oyster shells. And there's some promising pottery as well. There's a beautiful piece of old tile here. Here's a little bottle stopper, and it's still got the cork around the the glass there. What about you, Chill Bill? You got anything? Rien. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nothing. <laughs> Zip. Zippo. Well, it's early days. Zip. Well, so far it's been pretty slim picking. It's a bit of pottery and some pipe stems, but not a lot else. So hopefully, over there, I might have a little more luck. There's a button here. Another button. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to find out about the tailor. I get home and look through the magnifying glass. So 
well guys, I've got my uh, metal detector with me today because this end of town is quite tricky to do eyes only. So I like to use the detector here purely because it gives me basically another set of eyes. So what I've just found here, I detected, but then it's just sitting on the surface. So, you know, things can be found purely by eyes only and I'll show you what I've just found. It was literally sitting there just like I'm about to show you. And there it is, look, this button. In fact, it looks like it's welded itself to a piece of rock. But that looks like a really gorgeous military button. I think there's some numbers in the middle. I think it reads 79 or 19. I think that's definitely a nine. I might have it upside down. I've got it upside down, there we go. So, there's a crown at the top. with some, it looks like it could be a police badge. Or is it RF? Let me just give it a quick rub on my trousers just to get the uh, grime off. How's that? Anyone see what that is? Anyway, a bit of research into that and I'll let you know what it is. It's strange how it's, I've never seen it attached itself to a stone before, which is really weird. I like that good first find. Well there's a vulcanite bottle stopper here. Seems like um, they are quite rife all along the Thames for sure. And just over here is a, an interesting piece of metal. I'm not sure what that is. And also, I just found here a nice piece of wood with a nail right through it, which I love. Part of an old pier, I expect. I shall take that with me. I can see a coin here. It's probably another halfpenny, I expect. It's a yeah, a King George. And yes, it's another halfpenny, a King George halfpenny. So that's two I found today. And um, there's a relatively Christmassy piece of pottery. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So Simon's just made a really exciting find. That's right, we found a little copper. I don't know what you call it really, a little copper plaque handwritten by a young Mary A. Franklin, aged 10 years old, felony sentence, seven years, Banbury. So it's got all the information on there, we can look it up. Even it's got a number at the top, number 736, so maybe that was a felony number, perhaps. We'll have to look into that a bit more. On the other side, it's got Forget Me Not and the date 1844. That's absolutely Mid-Victorian. Incredible. Can I have a closer up? Of course. It's also amazing to think they were locking up ten-year-olds in the That is yeah, for seven years. Absolutely. What, what did a ten-year-old awesome. have to do to be locked up for seven years? What probably not find. a lot back then. Like you say, probably just took a piece so of bread. Mary A. Franklin, aged ten years old, felony. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. What a what a, a superb find. And I thought that was an Indian offering because you know, it's really writing, but it's well, actually hand engraved. That's the beauty of finding stuff. At first, you think it's you know something or nothing. But then, after close inspection, it keeps, you know, gifting you more, more information. This has got everything you ever want on it. Person's age, their name, where they were sentenced, Banbury, perhaps. I think that's in Essex, Banbury. Mm. Or was that Danbury? Yeah, there's a Danbury and a Banbury, so it's one of those two. So yeah, all that history on this one little plaque. That's, that's incredible. Yeah.
Now it's not far from here where Millbank Prison was situated, where the uh, National Gallery, where the Tate National Gallery now is. And I'm wondering if there's a link between that and Mary Franklin. I've just found another button here. And this one definitely looks like it has the, the name of a tailor, the name of something on it. I'm back home now and I'm going to do a little roundup of some of the items which were found on our Millbank Christmas mudlarking expedition. Um, now there were quite a few buttons. Um, Cy Fines found a button which he thinks might be from the police but we're not absolutely certain so you might be able to help ID it. And I'm going to start with this button here which I was very surprised to find out when I um, cleaned it off that it actually comes from Cornwall. And of course I grew up in Cornwall so there's a nice little local link for me there. It's from a tailor called Alexander Coon from St Austell in Cornwall and he was born in 1826 died in 1905 and as usual one of the reasons why buttons are one of my favourite finds there's such a lot of history that goes with it um, not only with Alexander Kuhn, but he, he had 10 children uh, with his wife and um, his son, who was Frederick Augustus Kuhn, his son, so um, in other words Alexander's grandson, um, enlisted into World War I. Again, there's a lot of World War I stories going on at the moment, but his grandson, his youngest grandson, um, who was called um, Monty, he signed up when he was 17 um, to go and fight in World War One because he wanted to go with his friend. So they weren't going to let him join up because he was a little too young, but he did end up going. And he wrote some letters back, which I found on the website of a St Austell school, remembering some of the old pupils. And Monty fought for at least two years, um, but sadly he died in Flanders in 1917. So again, a bit of a sad story there at the end, but it's such a good example of what you can find out just from a simple button. So this is the button from Alexander Kuhn, who was a tailor in St Austell, Cornwall in the 19th century. And this button is also from a tailor, and this one is from Edward Grove, who was a tailor in Lambeth in the 19th century. And in fact, um, one of my mudlarking friends, Mary Louise Plum, who has a very good blog about her mudlarking finds, she wrote an excellent piece all about Edward Groves, and I'll put the link on in case you want to read it. Before I get to my favourite find, which you can probably guess what it is, which is sitting here right in front of me, I'll do a quick roundup of the other objects. Um, this piece of wood, which is probably from a boat actually, I know I said it was maybe from a pier, but I don't know. I rather like the fact that that nail is still hanging on in there. And um, it's, uh, it's a nice shape. I'm sure I'll be able to do something with that. A bottle stopper with the piece of cork. What else? A few bits of pottery, a couple of halfpennies from King George V. Um, this little fragment of doll's head with the ear there. Probably Victorian, I should think. Um, Vulcanite bottle stopper, of course, got no shortage of those. 
this uh, interesting piece of metal. It looks like a little jelly mould. And this piece of tile here, which I like to think is sort of 18th century, but I could be wrong. I'm not a, an expert on pottery and ceramic material, I have to say, but it's pretty. I like that vivid blue colour on this bit of pottery here. The absolute star find of the day, as far as I'm concerned, and my real favourite was Simon's find, and I was green with envy when he found it. This copper engraved forget-me-not token, engraved, we like to think, by Mary A. Franklin in 1844, after she was sentenced to seven years in prison for felony. Forget-me-not tokens were often... Um, created in the 18th and 19th century as a way to express the, the pain and heartache of separation, particularly for relatives that were sentenced to be um, transported to Australia, for example, or other places abroad, because the likelihood was that they would never see their family again. So this is such a poignant find. A young 10-year-old girl sentenced for seven years, separated from her family for a very trivial crime. Uh, really, in the face of it. And she was probably no different, really, to the, the original mudlarks who were very, very poor, the poorest of the poor in society, who were often um, sent out to steal or beg and find bits and pieces in the River Thames to, to sell to make some money. And I'm sure that you know hunger would often have driven them to steal, um, as was the case for Mary A. Franklin. I was able to find out a little bit about her case, and um, I'm going to show you that now. I was able to see Mary Franklin's details on the records of Millbank Prison, a notorious penitentiary situated right next to where we were mudlarking. It was in use from 1812 to 1890. And actually, if you look back over my videos, I have done a video about Millbank Prison because I found a button from a Millbank prison guard. On 30th of September 1843, at Banbury Court, Mary A. Franklin was convicted of stealing bread and sentenced to seven years in Millbank, and it certainly wouldn't have been a pleasant place for a child. On her records, it says, Behaviour in prison good. Her short career has been marked by pilfering, encouraged by her parents, who are very badly disposed. Temper and disposition appear to be good. Well, I'm happy to say that Mary was pardoned in 1845. I've no idea what the rest of her life was like, but hopefully she stayed away from prison. The beautiful thing about mudlarking finds like Mary Franklin's tokens and Taylor's buttons with names on and other similar finds is that we're reminded that nobody disappears completely and there are always traces of lives left to show that they've been here even centuries later. And um, I just wanted to show you a few of my finds which do have names on that I've found over the years. Just a few of them. There's this one here, uh, a bracelet with Peter and Leslie engraved on it, which somehow ended up in the River Thames. There's this beautiful carved ivory or bone knife handle with HT on it. Somebody's put their initials in there. There is, of course, the padlock, which I did a video about recently. It belonged to the Morrow family. I've got a lovely little St Christopher's pendant here, lovely medallion. And on the back, it's engraved with love, Reg. So a real story behind that. There's Fred Jury's luggage tag from Woolwich Road, a World War I soldier. There is L.J. Cashin, another soldier, and J.A. Krellin, who was a, a sailor in World War I. And um, more recently, 
I stumbled across this wedding ring with Peter and Ruby engraved on it. Now, this isn't a mudlarking find, but when you're a mudlark, you tend to walk along looking for things all the time. And this was on the pavement. So I'm sure there's a story behind that. And I've, of course, I've tried to reunite it with Peter or Ruby, um, but I've not had any luck whatsoever. So if you know a Peter or Ruby that may have lost a gold wedding ring in October of this year, then please let me know. But all these items, they all have stories, personal stories that give us a glimpse, a snapshot into these lives so that really none of these people will ever be forgotten. Well, you may be wondering about my cryptic comment at the beginning of this video about things not always being what they seem initially. Well, you may have worked it out for yourself. But when I started to research Mary's token, I realised that it wasn't in fact the work of Mary, that it was the work of contemporary artist Annabelle Ludovici Gray, who herself was exploring the theme of loss and separation as experienced by somebody like Mary Franklin and many other convicts and young children experiencing um, incarceration in Millbank Prison. And so it wasn't Mary who made it, it wasn't real, it was the work of an artist. Initially we were a little bit disappointed but then we quickly realised that if it wasn't for Annabelle's work we would never have discovered the story of Mary. And so it didn't make it any less meaningful at all. Before I go, I'd just like to wish everybody, young and old, a very, very happy Christmas. Christmas isn't always the happiest time for some people. So if you're feeling a little sad or lonely this Christmas, lots and lots of love winging its way over from London to wherever you are. And I'd also like to say a very special happy Christmas to my sister and my three nieces and nephews. My sister Jo recently had a baby Elsie Spy, so happy Christmas Jo and Elsie, and happy Christmas Ted and Rosa. Ted, I can't wait to get the drawing that you're going to do for me, you're such a talented drawer, I'm really looking forward to getting that. And Rosa, you're such an excellent dancer, I hope you did well in your show that you did recently, and I'm really looking forward to coming to see you in one of your upcoming shows. Have a great Christmas, and I'll see you soon.